we're looking for exoplanet, well, to understand the solar system, but with what we have in mind really here is understanding the life. Life on Earth is, is quite an amazing feature. Um, we have no evidence of life on the other planet of the solar system. Maybe it will change. Maybe we'll find something, some on Mars, who knows? On Enceladus, on Titan, that would be interesting. But still, um, we will never be sure that if we find life on other planet on the solar system, it is not the same life that we have on Earth and have just moved around because there are a lot of uh, meteoritic uh, impact. We receive some piece of Mars and Earth is sending stuff to Mars. So it's, it's changing, it's moving a bit in the solar system. So, so the question really is, um, how come do you start life on Earth? I mean, what do you really need to do that? Um, there are some evidence that life was pretty early on, as soon as the Earth is formed, about one billion years old after the formations, um, there is some evidence that there may be life already. It's an amazing uh, number because right now we are about 4.6 billion years old. That's, a, that's the age of the Sun and that's the age of the Earth. So life is there since a long time on the solar system and on Earth. So the question is, well, what about the other planet? And I think this is one of the most uh, key questions that is behind this whole search for exoplanet. It's not only about the diversity of the planet, it's not only about the formation of the planet, it's about finding life, finding life on other system. Is life a universal process? Is it built the same way? We have uh, 20 amino acids building life on Earth, but there are zillions of amino acids. So why these ones? Are they the ones you need to build life? Do we, na do we have some kind of similar structure that the DNA elsewhere? Is it so unlikely that you, that you start life? Not in terms of, of having life early on on, on Earth, but all the context. What do you need? What is the, the ingredients? What are the chemistry? Do you need water? I guess so. Do you need nice temperature? I guess so. But is that enough? Do you need a moon? Is the moon an important fact? Do you need Jupiter? Jupiter is a shield for us. It attracts a lot of meteoritic impact and prevents us to have a lot of material falling on Earth. There is even a strong theory that seems to suggest that the solar system has had a dramatic event uh, early on, about, about one million years old, after the formation, that has changed the whole structure of the planet in the solar systems and has removed a lot, a lot of this deadly meteoritic impact that could then kill life after, like it has killed the din dinosaur, very likely. So all these are questions that you can start to answer by looking on other planet. Why? Because you have so many planets on other stars. You have tons of different planets with different temperature, different compositions, different atmosphere, different ingredients. You can compare. You can see, oh, okay, so if I have another planet that looks like the Earth, does it mean that I have life? Or I need something else? I need a moon, I need this and that. Um, and that's a question that we start to answer right now. It's a tremendous difficult question to answer. Well, first is because stars are very far. So you cannot just go there. You can barely travel in the solar system, send probes, and we do so. We have a nice picture, we even go to Pluto, we even bring fantastic picture there. We don't land and bring back, but we, at least we take picture. Well, this is easy. It's nothing compared to going to another star. Um, when you need a couple of hours for, life, for light to reach the, um, the, the outskirt of the solar system, well, you need a couple of years to reach the nearest stars. This is the very nearest star. 
Centauri system A and B, and with another star which is quite famous right now, which is Proxima Centauri, which is the small stars. It all belongs to untripled systems. They're all going around each other. And Proxima Sen B, so Proxima Sen, sorry, has a planet detected recently. And, um, and, and all this is, is great, it's fantastic, but it's very far. So how could you tell that there is life there? Well, I think we have some, some reason to believe that you have at least ways to do that in astronomy. Well, first, you can study the Earth without being on it. Well, take any satellite orbiting the Earth. They used to predict the weather. They used to predict a lot of, uh, um, I mean, things like agriculture and the boats. And they can just look. By looking, you learn a lot by studying in detail the color. I mean, you can do spectra, you can really try to get a lot of information out of this. So, astronomers will observe atmosphere. They will observe the atmosphere of this planet. This is still tough, but it's easier than going there. Um, some of this atmosphere may be a bit more easy than others. The Earth is, would be a difficult atmosphere. It's a very small atmosphere, 50 kilometers out of 5,000 kilometers, which is the size of the Earth. So it will be really something difficult to do. But it's not impossible. It's certainly more possible to do that than to fly, to go to another planet. Um, so let's imagine that we, we study the atmosphere of an exoplanet. So what are we looking for? Well, first, we would look for an atmosphere, because it is understood that to have life, you need an atmosphere. Or at least you would expect life to modify the atmosphere at some point. Well, life on Earth has completely changed the Earth's atmosphere. Without life, there would not be oxygen. So maybe you can look for something like the oxygen, or you can even look for the oxygen it may tell you that something has happened and has changed the atmosphere of the planet. And that's the kind of idea that astronomy is looking forward. Well, we can do more than that, because we can not only look at a an, an major species, we can look at a bit more rare element. It's a matter of detail. How much detail are you going to get? Well, first you will look at very easy stuff, and then you will expand and getting better and looking for more details. And then you can play an interesting game. You can go to talk to people doing chemistry on Earth and ask them, well, could you try to reproduce an atmosphere in your lab? Could you try to reproduce life in your lab? It seems a bit of a silly question these days, but it is not completely impossible that people in labs We'll start by playing with the molecules, we'll try one day to reproduce life. And they can just change a bit the composition, trying to tell me, okay, well, if I have that kind of life, this is what I would expect. And then by observing, comparing, you may slowly get into a perception that you will get something out of life. So it will never be a sharp, sharp cut question. It's like, oh, it's obvious, there will be life. It will be, okay, there is enough evidence, there is maybe 60% chance. It will be very few at the beginning. But then, after some time, you will be more confident because you will have more detail and you will build up a better knowledge and you will know, okay, no, I'll know better than now. I believe it's, there is more chance. This is the kind of process that we hope to go. It's a tremendous process, it's difficult, and it requires a couple of elements. Well, first we need a planet. But we need a good planet. So we need a planet that we think may have life. So what are there is this planet? Well, we think that a planet too big cannot have life because it must be, I mean, if you get hydrogen full of gas, you cannot stay there. You need to just sit on it in a way. We believe we need water. Um, so we believe we should kind of look for a rocky planet with water. You can have a lot of water or a little bit of water, but you need to kind of to have both there. And then you need the planet to be located at the right distance to the stars. And there has been quite a lot of um, uh, modeling there, trying to define what is the right distance. So let's imagine that we are on Earth, 
and we change the orbit of the Earth. We go a little bit closer, next to Venus. What will happen? So you will increase the temperature on Earth, and there is a point when you would increase so much, then you will build up too much gas, and you will build up a greenhouse effect. That's a global warming, extreme global warming, and then you would practically burn everything, end up like Venus. So you're too close. If you move away, it will still be nice for some time, but then it would become so cold on Earth, then slowly everything will freeze. And Earth will not be anymore with ocean, will be completely frozen. And we think that without liquid water, it would make life difficult. So there is a range which turns out to be between Venus and Mars on a, for a star like the Sun. Well, there are different kinds of stars. So some of stars, they are much smaller. When a star is smaller, the temperature of the star is way cooler. So the Sun is about 5,700 degrees on the surface of the Sun. Well, if you take a smaller stars, they are called M stars, you can get down to 4,000, 3,000, even 2,500. That's the coolest star you can get. If you want to be cooler, it's not a star anymore. So these stars, you can imagine, because it's, it's much cooler, you can get much closer. So practically, if you want to be at the right location with these stars, you have to be much, much closer. And that's the interesting part of it, because you don't need to be orbiting with a one-year period. You can be orbiting with five, ten days, or maybe twenty days around it. And that's exactly what is happening for this planet detected on Proxima Centauri. Eleven days. The star is very small, so it turns out that if you make the mathematics, you realize that the temperature is just fine. So this concept, it's called habitable zone. So for each of the stars, you can define where would be the right place. And then you can optimize the search. You can try to figure out, okay, if I find a planet like the Earth close, but if the star is small, I should look for life, because it's a good place. I can also look for a planet farther out, if the star is brighter. So there is a whole range of different kind of stars, different kind of planet, staying, keeping the fact that it has to be rocky. And this is something you can get from the size. We understand that the planet smaller, that let's say 1.3 times the size of the Earth should be okay, of about three, four times the mass of the Earth. Down to Mars is okay. If you're too small, then you cannot keep the atmosphere because there's not enough gravity. So there's a good range between half of the Earth and two, three times of the Earth, where it would be good in terms of mass. And there's a distance that depends on the star. And we now finding these targets. This is today. This is going on. We detecting right now this planet. And tomorrow, we will observe the atmosphere and we may get the first hints that something is going on. In 20 years, 50 years, there will be a complete new uh, paradigm because people will have evidence of atmosphere on some of these planets. And for the first time, they will be able to tell how likely you may have life or not. And that's amazing because in just 20 years, how much progress we've moved. We moved from an idea of, well, you, there may be life, there may be life elsewhere, to the fact where we will be able to tell that planet on that star, there may be life.